Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the evolving value of information management discussion. Um, I'm Donald Roll. I am the managing director of Alacra, but more importantly, I'm the president of SLA Europe. Yay! You just see anything can happen. Dreams, you know. Just who would have thought? Who would have thought? But I'm having a ball. It's been a great year. Um, this was, you know, let me just give you a little bit of history. First of all, let me thank Morgan Stanley for hosting this fine event. This is a fantastic facility, Stephen, so thank you very much. Yeah, hey. And uh, even bigger thanks on behalf of SLA to the Financial Times for sponsoring the survey and also hosting the networking um, event after the panel this evening. So thank you very much, Mr. Mann, and off we go. All right, a um, little history. Um, this started in 2012. Uh, Stephen Phillips had some discussions with the FT, and which led to the collaboration with the SLA for the survey, and there's a copy of which is on everybody's chair. Highly recommend that you uh, take it home with you. Um, it's also on the web if you prefer to get an electronic copy. And uh, there has, there's some really good information in there, and there are some recommendations that we're going to be discussing tonight that uh, I wholeheartedly believe in. Uh, there's been a massive amount of change in the 17 years I've been involved in the information industry. And uh, you know, I think there is an exciting role to, for information professionals to play in the new digital world. And to give you a perspective, I still remember the first IBM PC. I remember the first time we got email. And we used to pray when we started Alacra in 97 that the internet didn't go down transatlantic, over the transatlantic more than once a day. And that's only 17 years ago. Um, so things have come a long, long way. And uh, the survey actually came out in, in uh, 2013, about, about this time last year. And uh, we're glad to have this session in, in London to share with you some of the results, the analysis, and please, let's make it interactive tonight. Uh, so that's, that's it for me. I'd like to turn it over to James Mann, who's the Global Sales Director for B2B at the Financial Times, who's gonna give us some further insight. Thanks. Thank you, James. Can everybody hear me? Yes? Um, right, um, we're here now for the panel session. Starting perfectly on time, Stephen noticed at 18.30, <laughs> so, yes, which is very good. Um, uh, before we actually start the panel session, I'd just like to ask how many people, I'd like to, you to raise your hand if you've actually read this. Okay, oh yes, we, can, we, we all read it. Oh, yes. yes. Okay, great, okay. And can you raise your hand if you've actually started to implement the um, the tasks and the attributes. Okay. Okay. Right. You what, if okay. Doing it? what if you're okay, those who are already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's why they're <laughs> the panel. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well for those who haven't read it, I would say pick it up. There are copies. I think there's some spare copies over there. Um, do take it and read it. It is a very good read, um, very helpful, etc. So on our panel this evening we have three people. Um, we have Sarah Farhi, who is the Global Head of Library Services at Allen and & Overy. And um, I'm not going to run through the blurb that was on the website, because I assume everybody can have read that. But what I did ask each of the panellists to do was to give me an interesting fact about them, because that always helps to bring a bit of colour to them as a person. And so Sarah said that she once manned the door of the beer tent at the London Irish Rugby Club Festival and oh, refused former British and Irish Lion and English World Cup winner, Mike Cat Entry. So, she's both a bouncer and a sports fan. It was too small, it didn't look as big as the others. So. <laughs> so, um, next, we have Janice Lachance, who is the Chief Executive Officer of SLA. And we're very lucky that she happens to be on part of her European tour, so is able to join us here today, so that's great. And Janice's interesting fact is that she didn't speak a word of English until she was five years old. And until that point, she only spoke French. 
which she still doesn't. Did oh. you say that? <laughs> I see. I knew somebody would say that. <laughs> I put that in with Kate. I said, you did. Somebody will I would say, say still yes. God speak English. <laughs> but anyway. Sorry. Don't worry. I didn't speak at all. So. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> I'm taking lessons from Don. <laughs> Very good. And then finally, we have Stephen Phillips, who is the global head of BIS, Analytics and Publishing, here at Morgan Stanley. And his interesting fact was that he chose to become a library information professional instead of going to train to be a professional golfer. So we didn't realize we had this potential yeah. <laughs> golf person any here. So that's kind of an interesting. Um, anyway. None at all. Okay. <laughs> What's your handicap? What's your handicap now? Now, about mm, 12. What's four? Four. Then lower, officially. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oi, Vickery. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are, interesting things. So what, what, we're, what we're here today, the format, is that we're actually going to cover the 12 tasks, which are on page 31, if you've picked up the booklet that we've kindly got been given. Um, and what we thought was we'd divide them up um, and each panelist can take three of them and talk for about 10 minutes or so about their experience of demonstrating those. Um, and then they're all going to cover the three remaining ones. Um, so what I'll do, the, the ones they'll all cover are number three, which is about actively communicate, number seven, about build relationships, and number eight, be a technical mastermind. Um, I'm doing technical oh, yeah. Sorry. So. Sorry. 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 Everybody can do it. Okay. Everybody can do it. Okay. So first, um, I'm going to hand over to Janice, but what I think we want to do about questions is that people will do their little bit of talking and, and give their examples, and then we're very happy to take questions from the floor, although we may ask the, panel, the remaining panellists to make a comment, mm -hmm. and then we'll take questions from the floor, so we want this to be as interactive as possible. We have a deadline of leaving the room by eight o'clock so that we can have our drinks and nibbles of food. So that will be the latest we stay. Um, we'll see. Everybody's looking really worried now. I think 7.45. Okay, 7.45 is an hour. I mean, we're aiming for an hour, but we'll see. We might get into a lots of exciting conversation. Absolutely. So firstly, I'd like to ask Janice to Great. talk about. Well, thank, thank you very much, Kate. And thanks all of you for for being here. I know it's uh, uh, still technically the end of summer, but there's a bit of a feel that we're all back at work seriously and the holidays are over. And so um, as you all get back into the, the swing of things, I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm going to start at the bottom with mine. I'm going to start with number 12, change your mindset. Um, this is one I think that covers so much territory and it really makes a lot of these other tasks possible. The reality is that you really do have to act and, and function as though you are the owner of a business. Think about where you do business on a day-to-day -day basis, think about um, where you choose to buy your coffee, where you choose to, to drop off your, your laundry or dry cleaning. It, that is not a librarian's task. On the other hand, if you're a true information professional and one that according to this study will be successful, the reality is that you have to have a different way of looking at your customers and the people you deal with. It's very easy to think, oh, they're friends, they're colleagues, we go to lunch together, we enjoy time together, but the reality is that you do have to treat them as though they're customers and you have to give them a reason to come back and get more of your services and use your services repeatedly, not just on a one-time basis. So it's about going the extra mile. The way you choose to, who you do business with, that's, who, that's how they're going to choose who they do business with. They have to feel welcome, they have to feel as though you want to help them, and they have to feel as though you will give them actually more than they're asking for. So I do hope that that is something that 
all of you can start taking on at this point. And it really is just a new way of looking at your colleagues, looking at the people who are asking you for information or data or analysis. Look at them slightly differently, not just as coworkers, but as people who you want to be coming back for more and more of your business. So that to me, I think will cover a lot of these other points, but it's fundamental. And even though it's number 12, it was number one in my book. So I wanted to start with that. Now, following on with that, I'm gonna jump to number nine. Go to the top. Now, I know that's asking a lot. The reality is that you have to find a way to make sure that the senior leaders in your organization understand the contribution that you're making to their success, to their businesses. And so that means, first of all, you have to be able to articulate it. You have to know it yourself. So uh, my colleagues are going to talk about being a part of the business, being strategic, understanding the goals of the business. So that's fundamental to this. You have to know the details of the business. You have to know where you fit in, how you fit in, and the difference that you've made in bringing the business to success. And I'm using the term business, could be a corporation, could be a not-for-profit, could be a government agency. It could be a whole range of, of organizations, but the reality is that you have to have a fundamental understanding of what the goals are, what the strategy is, and where the business wants to go. Otherwise, you can't articulate your value. And once you get that value in your head, once you understand your own contribution to the big picture, then you have to find a way to get it to the top guy or gal, hopefully more women than usual. But the reality is that you have to find a way to communicate that. Now, how do you do that? Well, that means you have to be able to understand the bureaucracy, understand the way it's organized. Who are the key players in your organization? Who are the decision makers? Who has the last word in budget, your budget or your resources or how many people you have to work with on your staff? Know all those people. This says go to the top. I say go to the decision maker. Go to the people who are influencing those at the top. And if you ever get a chance to ride the elevator with the top person, have that elevator speech ready and know what it is you need to do and know what it is you want to say to that person. Otherwise, work around them. Find out who they listen to. And that's all out there. That's all out there in the grapevine in every organization. Do a little sleuthing, figure out who that person's listening to, get to them and make sure they understand your contributions. Um, the, the last one, since we're all gonna do technical mastermind, um, uh, the last one I wanna talk about is number two. And that may be not the most difficult one, but maybe the one that's the most controversial because I know in fact that a number of um, a number of discussions at SLA have centered around this. And it's about the fundamental role of the information professional. The, the reality is that people want to hear your opinion, your views. They want you to provide analysis. SLA members debate this all the time, and I've been listening to it now for 11 years, and I'm so glad the FT came along to sort of settle the argument, hopefully once and for all. There are information professionals who believe they have to be objective who believe that they have to be sort of like Caesar's wife, above the debate, above the discussion, that they have to just provide the statistics, the data, the information, whatever was asked for. And it turns out that people want more than that from you. 
they value you, they trust you, they believe in your abilities, they believe in what you bring to the table. So use that and take advantage of it. They want to know your opinion. They want you to provide analysis and they want you to provide it in a way that's easily understandable. So this idea of decision ready information, put it together in a way that is easy to consume, easy to understand, that somebody can pick it up and go, this is gonna make a huge bit of difference in the decision I make. Um, I have a great story. Um, I used to work a lot with reporters and there was one reporter who told me a story about the librarian at his media outlet. Uh, and he asked for the address of a source that he wanted to write a note to and thank because this person had been particularly helpful to him. Well, he came in the next morning and there was a stack of papers this high and it was everything you ever wanted to know about that person, you know, where they were born, their bio, where they lived, how much their house was worth, you know, all of this wonderful information that's available to all of you, but really all he wanted was an address to write a note. So he had to flip through all of this and find it. Now, that's probably an extreme example, and I'm sure nobody in this room would ever respond to a request that way. But think about what it is the person is looking for. Think about what they want. Think about the question you're answering and the context. This was great information about that person. It wasn't needed, it wasn't wanted, it wasn't what they were looking for, and it actually took more time than if the person maybe had just gone to the internet on their own, which is what we don't want them to do because you can make a huge difference. So think about how you're presenting the information, but more than that, think about how you can analyze it. You know the information and the data better than anybody else. And the fact that you could help that person sift through this, that you could help the decision maker get to the bottom line a lot quicker because of what you know and you can contribute and the fact that you're plugged in to the um, to the strategy of the organization, to the goals of the organization, to me is critically important. And so um, I'm going to end on that note, unless somebody sees somebody else, I was supposed to, something else I was supposed yeah. to talk to. Do you want to. to do the technical mastermind? Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in, but, but I do want to hear from you all about the analysis part and whether you think that's an appropriate role for information professionals, because I've been debating this for a long time, and believe me, uh, John Latham knows. He used to, he and I worked together for a number of years, and um, he never hesitated to give me his opinion. Uh, and, and it was always, always valuable and important. It's, it's the, the role to me is just so much more than providing information. That's how you're going to beat the Google syndrome. That's how you're going to be able to, to get people over this sense that they can do it themselves. This isn't a do-it-yourself job. You all bring a tremendous amount of value, and part of that is your ability to process this. All right, technical mastermind. Um, mastermind, again, another huge, huge um, task for all of you. But I think what you want to do is make sure your customers don't get ahead of you on technology. They will look to you for guidance on technology, but as soon as you see a trend coming, I, James talked about uh, going from desktop to mobile and all of these things. You know, just think about the changes in technology. We all thought devices would get smaller and smaller. I mean, now there's there are wrist watches. There's clothing that's interactive, but go buy your next phone and it's probably going to have a bigger screen than the one you had before. So it, it, the, the capacity to absorb information and learn information, I think is changing constantly and how people want to get their information, how they want to hear from you, 
how they want you to communicate with them is always, always going to change. So don't let them get ahead of you. Once they can, once they sense that you're old fashioned, that you're behind the times, that you haven't kept up, that you're still doing things, James, to the desktop rather than to mobile, they're going to leave you behind. They're going to look <coughs> for another source. They're going to look for someplace else to build this relationship and get this information. So stay ahead of the game. And now I'm going to do a pitch for the Special Libraries Association because a lot of these topics are addressed in webinars that we give, during in sessions, during our annual conference every year, in courses that we that we provide both online distance learning and in person. So don't feel as though you're out there alone on this. And I know the chapter also does a great job in continuous learning and professional development. Unfortunately, you're in a field where your degree is only good for a small number of years. And so you really have to pick up this notion of keeping yourselves current, learning constantly, keeping an eye on what the trends are and going from there. And you have resources. You're not in alone. You have a great professional society, a great professional organization. Rely on us, let us know what you need, and we'll do everything that we can to provide it for you. Thank you, Jen. Sure. Do either Stephen or Sarah? Oh, yeah. Do I have anything more to say? I'm sure Stephen has something to say. Well, you, you know, I, I picked up on something that you actually said there, Janice, which was you don't want people to go to the internet and do this stuff for themselves or do it on their own. And I would actually really beg to differ there okay. because I think um, my question would be not so much why not, but uh, from my perspective, you know, what if we can empower end users to do the work for themselves and actually deliver something, um, you, know, you know, satisfy their own requirements, then I would say that that's exactly what we should be doing. And if somebody can use Google to go and do that, then I, I, I would positively encourage them to do that where there's, you know, potentially low risk to the organization of that information you know, not being reliable at the end of the day. But I think my concern would be that, that you, you know, by kind of, Trying to monopolize the, the that that business as it were um that dilutes value at the end of the day because people look at it and say well why do i need you to do this for me i can do this mm -hmm. for myself and i'm quite mm -hmm. capable and competent to do this and actually if we can come to the table saying actually you can do that and that's great and you should do it but here's all the other stuff that we can do that is actually further up the curve further up the value mm -hmm. chain um, that's when that resonates, I think, with a, with a stakeholder or a sponsor to say, actually, that could be really useful to me. Mm -hmm. I can get this stuff, fine. This stuff, tell me more about this and how, and how actually you can add value to my business. Okay. Well, I'm not going to give them the last word. So um, <laughs> let me just say that I think even in a, in a professional environment that even some of the what seems like fundamental information or a basic search i know people can do it and i i believe people ought to do it but i think that the information professional has a role as a coach to make sure they know the difference right. that's what worries me yeah. is that you know yes sure use google because i know we all use it you all use it Every, a lot everyone uses it. it's a great tool why wouldn't we but you, I think, particularly in the business both of you all are in, you probably have to spend a lot of time coaching people to make sure they know the difference about what can be appropriately sourced from Google and what they should come to you for. So there's risk management. There's concern about information being accepted as valid and the most recent when it might not be, and you can't tell that from a, a Google search results page. So uh, my only thing would be great. If you're comfortable letting them go at it, terrific. Google it is, but I would just spend time making sure they know the difference. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well done. He's keeping score. Right. Right. Oh, God, not Sarah. score. Okay. Did you uh, I, well, 
I wanted to say that I think your first point was absolutely right, change your mindset, because, and this goes into my, my talk in a minute, I mean, our businesses are changing dramatically. Everything is changing, not just the technology, but also actually the structure of some of our businesses, how our firms and our companies are reacting to things that are happening in the world are changing. Everything has changed. It's not the same as it was five, 10 years ago. And I think you've got to be flexible in terms of your options. You've got to be flexible in terms of how you look at things. And it's not one answer and that's it. So I think you, I mean, so to, to mediate between the two of you, it's not necessarily the internet or not the internet. It really is about, in a funny sort of way, equipping our users to be information literate. Mm -hmm. So there is judgment that yes. they can make. And you know that means we have to change our mindset so dramatically because I never say that we haven't all changed it already, but it's not one change either. It's a constant evolution. We're on a journey with our users now. We can't, as you rightly say, we can't just say, well, that's nothing to do with me anymore because information is everywhere. Information is everybody's. Nobody owns it anymore. So what we've got to do is we've got to be flexible and actually really concentrate on where we can bring skills and value to what we can offer our users. Not maybe drop things that used to be dear to our hearts and we thought was really the core of our roles, but actually if it's no longer valuable, we need to move on and go to the more valuable things and, and do something that people actually care about. So I think change your mindset is a massive thing, one of the most important things on the list, personally. Okay, thank you. Does anybody in, in the audience have a question? I don't know what to put for those. Yes. I find making decision ready um, information the most difficult because, you know, when probably many of us started out 20 years ago, um, we were a generalist role and we were a conduit which, to, to information which was is now available to everyone. And if you've worked in, say, legal or banking, there is only so much that you can present decision ready information in terms of analysis of say you know financials or, or a legal opinion so even if you might want to so you know what 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 do you what and i can understand your point when you said about giving the, them the, the information they want rather the you know being precise rather than just the load of other stuff that is not actually what was wanted but in terms of much more sort of technical decision ready that is Perhaps, you know, where, where do you draw the line or how, how, do, how, can, how can you do that if you're working in quite a sort of, you know, as I say, mm -hmm. sort of investment banking or, or legal? Well, I, I'm glad to start, but I'm sure my colleagues are more expert in this. It, to me, it's knowing your customer. It is the person who's going to make this decision, are they a visual learner or do they like to read and highlight or underscore or whatever. So I, to me, it's getting to know that person and trying to customize things for that client of yours. Um, and I know that, that that gets very, very difficult when you're working for a number of people, but what is the, what's the format? I mean, as we walk through here, you can see, you know, Morgan Stanley, here's the, you know, here, everything's all right on this slide. Here's the guest Wi-Fi. Here's the date, the Twitter. I mean, everything is all right here. So I would say if I worked at Morgan Stanley, I'd work really hard to get as much as I could on one page. Right? Am you I wrong? Just... Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, I'm just, you know, looking at this. I mean, so what's the culture of the, the place where you work? What, and then more specific.